My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Ed Lefferts. We're at Park Avenue Fine Wines in Portland, March 8th, 2021. Before we start, I'd like to thank uh, Neil and Stacy from Park Avenue for letting us be here today. This is Likewise. really awesome of them. Uh, and thank you, Ed, for being here today and, and interviewing with us. Uh, first question for you, most important question. Why wine? Uh, why wine? There's several answers. Uh, I guess the three main answers being it's delicious. I fell in love with it. Uh, working in restaurants for the majority of my working career. Uh, it was my second dream job um, <laughs> to play in baseball and throwing a baseball for a living. So when that uh, didn't work out, uh, you know, it's years and years of restaurants led to a passion for wine and a story I'll probably end up telling a little bit later, just uh, sitting down with a winemaker and having a conversation led to a daydream about making wine some day in the future, never really thinking it was going to come to fruition. And then just after years and years of daydreaming about it, we pulled the trigger and moved to Oregon and slowly made it happen. Uh, so, and then yeah, just years and years of restaurant work and pairing food with wine and being able to taste different wines. Um, just always wanted to kind of have my own after several years of selling mm -hmm. other people's wine and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So let's back up. Obviously a lot of story to tell here before, before we get to, to the current point. So tell me about uh, starting in restaurant work and, and kind of your upbringing education before, before that. Uh, I've only ever had one job that I can recollect that wasn't inside of a restaurant. Uh, my first job in high school as a senior was a dishwasher at a yacht club. Uh, I grew up in the Bay Area in a town called Benicia, California, not too far from Napa. Um, but unfortunately I left the area before I started drinking wine. Um, so high school, uh, I always had a ball in my hand. Sports was just a thing of my childhood. And I always dreamed of being a major league pitcher after following my uncle's career. So my uncle pitched for uh, 16 years in the big leagues. Your uncle's Craig. Craig Lefferts. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So awesome. I, I grew up a Giants fan. And the first thing I noticed when I saw you was that Dodger mask you were wearing there. <laughs> Uh, so go Giants. We'll, um, we'll save that for off camera. Right, right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I always wanted to pitch in the big leagues, follow my uncle's career. He was kind of like my childhood hero. Um, and so grew up with the ball in my hand, whether it was baseball, basketball, football, um, just chugging around Benicia, uh, playing home run derby and playing basketball whenever we could. And um, so my kind of sports background led to me wanting to play college baseball. And after just the dishwasher job led to a prep cook. I uh, did the prep cook thing for a couple months and uh, started a conversation with a girl across the line that was a waitress and found out that making tip money was better than dishwasher money and so I quickly wanted to kind of get to that side of the service and get out of the kitchen. Um, that kind of led me to my first job waiting tables at an Applebee's <laughs> shortly after high school and so that was after I had moved from the Bay Area down to Phoenix, Arizona, to live with some uh, classmates that were going to college down there, and I didn't really have a college path in mind yet, but didn't want to live in Tucson, Arizona with my family, and so I kind of just went up to Phoenix to hang out with uh, some buddies and just kind of relax for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, again, tip money, got into restaurants, waiting tables, just climbed the ladder from Applebee's to a family seafood restaurant to Eventually, kind of resort work was where the good money was at that time in Arizona, and it allowed me the schedule to go to school in the morning, uh, tried out for the Mesa Community College baseball team, and was a walk-on for the baseball team, and so I got to go to school, go to baseball practice in the afternoon, and then go to an evening job in a restaurant and just work a few hours and make enough money to pay my portion of the rent, you know, between me and my buddies in the, in the apartment. So um, the restaurant lifestyle just became that. It was uh, a job and a lifestyle and I just got really uh, comfortable in it. I uh, loved having access to food. Mm -hmm. um, always made great friends throughout the different restaurant jobs that I had and so those relationships, um, some were short-lived and uh, some relationships are still alive today from people that I worked with 10-15 years ago back mm -hmm. in Arizona. So. Really cool industry, you know, we talk about um, the Oregon wine industry uh, and the hospitality industry being widely connected and so that's kind of just been my, my career for the better part of 27 years. So what point, you mentioned, you mentioned restaurants and food and friends and all that, so what point does wine sort of become a thing on your radar? I quickly learned in my first fine dining job that I needed to speak the language of wine uh, in order to make better money and, and actually look like I knew what I was doing. 
Um, so early on, actually, that my first fine dining job I applied for was for a waiter position, and in the interview, I failed the wine uh, questions uh, pretty badly. And so they offered me uh, more or less like a food running job where I could kind of get in the building and, and start to learn. And that's kind of when I started asking more questions and tasting wine whenever there was an opportunity and uh, just kind of fell in love with it instantly. Um, the resort world back in Arizona is a lot different than uh, in terms of what's on the lists and what people are buying. It was predominantly California Cabernet mm -hmm. uh, for the better part of my wedding career in Arizona. And so, I mean, Cabernet just kind of became what I was drinking the most of and what I liked the most and what was selling for the top dollar in the restaurants. And so um, I missed out on the European wine train, which uh, is only uh, only reflects badly on, on my wine education, but um, I know I, I wish I was in restaurants, you know, like Stacy in New York, where they're, you know, rubbing shoulders with MSs and tasting mm -hmm. Burgundy and Champagne all the time, uh, Riesling and you know Spanish and Italian wines. I, I never really got to work heavily with those type of lists, and so that's kind of my weakness. But um, nonetheless, fell in love with Cabernet. I mm -hmm. uh, always dreamt of making Cabernet from the first time I had that daydream. Um, and I guess the, you know, if I had to pick a couple of epiphany moments with wine, the first one was I did a ride along with uh, an old girlfriend who was a, a, had a part time job as a wine distributor for a small portfolio in Scottsdale and uh, Todd Graff from Frank, Frank Family in Napa came down to do a ride along and, and some tastings with some restaurants in her portfolio and uh, I asked if I could tag along. Um, and they allowed me to kind of just ride along with them for the day and so I got to go to a handful of different restaurants with Todd Graff and his assistant and sit in on these wine tastings which was a first experience for me and got to listen to him tell his story to a couple of different buyers and we hung out for most of the day and uh, he came back to our house that night for dinner and opened a bunch of his wine and we opened a bunch of wine from our cellar and just really got to talk to a winemaker for the first time and he shared a bunch of cool stories and I was just instantly, that became my second dream job like the very next day. It was like, what could be cooler than living on a vineyard in Napa, traveling, doing winemakers dinners around the country during the off season and uh, he, he painted a picture that was quite different from reality, but uh, <laughs> it, was, it, it was cool. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wanted to, I was always a daydreamer. Uh, I've always played the lottery, thinking maybe I'm gonna you know, hit the lottery and be able to stop waiting tables and go buy a mansion and do whatever I want. So in those early days, waiting tables in Scottsdale, I would take the long way to work and drive through Fountain Hills and look at all the, the big houses and drive past Mike Tyson's house and all this funny stuff and think maybe someday I can mm -hmm. rub shoulders with these guys. Um, and then after this, experience with Todd Graff, it was like, well, maybe I can become a winemaker and go rub shoulders with those guys. That'd be really cool. Mm -hmm. um, but again, never really thinking it was going to be a, a real thing. It was always just a, a daydream. Mm -hmm. Probably got off path there. What was mm -hmm. I? No, that's, a, that's, a, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. So it's still a daydream at this point, but at some point you end up in Oregon making wine. So tell me about the kind of connection there. What, 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 what makes you take that next step? Um, I was on the long path in school, um, kind of paying my way through community college for many years and working in restaurants. And then I finally uh, went to ASU and was on the, the slow path there as well. So between 2011, I'm oh, sorry, 2001 and 2011 was my extended college days. And then like the, well, it was actually before I actually graduated. So after my last physical classes, I was on to like my college thesis and that was the time when I could actually step away from campus and, mm -hmm. and do my own thing. So my girlfriend at the time, who's my wife now, we kind of just talked about where we could move to. Um, I had, you know, this wine making dream in the back of my pocket and thought about going back to the Bay Area. I uh, still had tons of friends in, in the Bay and mm -hmm. reached out to a couple of them looked at housing and XYZ and just quickly realized that we couldn't afford that at all. So um, the next best thing seemed like Portland. Um, we had never been here, didn't know anybody in the Oregon area. 
um, but knew that it was a great food and wine culture and us both having backgrounds in the restaurants thought that we could probably just come up here sight unseen and find work uh, pretty easily so uh, we did just that we kind of quit our restaurant jobs back in Phoenix and uh, piled our five dogs into a car and towed and everything that we owned up to Camas, Washington. Uh, we had found this rental on Craigslist in Camas that seemed like it was the dream. It was this two acre property that like backed up to a forest and we had these five dogs and thought, wow, that would be really cool. And we were, you know, Google mapped the trip to Portland and we were 20 minutes outside of downtown Portland. So it didn't seem like a bad commute. Got to travel 20 minutes anywhere in Phoenix to get any place. So <laughs> didn't, didn't really phase me. Um, uh, then we moved up here and realized that that two and a half acre property had no fencing. Um, and so our, our plans were quickly deflated. Uh, there's no fen there's no house in Arizona that doesn't have a, a gigantic fence around it. So it never even crossed my mind to ask the landlord if this two and a half acre was property was fenced for our dogs. Um, so we were committed to a one year lease there and we did just the one year, I think, before we went and found a fenced rental. Um, so that's kind of how we got to Oregon mm -hmm. um, in those first couple years. Uh, the first couple years for me, I kind of hopped around a couple different restaurant jobs just trying to find a good place. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife was lucky. Her first job was at Veritable Quandary, uh, the old VQ. And so she was able to settle into a really cool uh, restaurant gig right away. Um, and we made several great relationships there um, that we still have today. Um, one of the first wine escapes that we made uh, shortly thereafter was on kind of like a field trip with VQ. Again, I didn't work there, but I was invited to tag along, which was awesome. Um, and we went out to Big Table Farm and that kind of environment um, was exactly what that old daydream in Scottsdale, Arizona was about um, being out in the valley on the hill overlooking some property just doing your thing uh, kind of living off the land my degree was in sustainability um, so although i'm no farmer um, a lot of my studies were on sustainable living and living off the land and mm -hmm. what you can do with an acre of property and to sustain just yourself and your family and they were doing just that so that was cool uh, meeting brian and claire awesome people made a great kind of friendship there mm -hmm. and um, they quickly became um, kind of uh, mentors, if, if they'll let me say that. Um, I was very uh, fond and kind of jealous of what they were able to do out there. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was just, that was the dream. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was uh, kind of the first vision that, okay, maybe this is a possibility if, you know, I, after hearing their story, you know, they came up. He already had a great background in winemaking, which is fantastic. I had zero background, but to learn that they could you know, do their startup winery with uh, you know, a little bit of money in their pocket um, kind of opened up my mm -hmm. own vision to think maybe if I can save a couple of dollars, I can buy a ton of fruit and find someone to mentor me and um, took a few years, but that's kind of how we got started. Mm -hmm. So you have that you have that possibility in your mind, and, and you're thinking. So tell me about figuring out how how where how you're going to make wine, where you're going to make it, what you're going to call it, how you're going to sell it. All those kind of things now at, at this point have to become reality for you. So what's the what's the process? Yeah, yeah I'll start, and then you can remind me the rest of those questions. But um, just connections to restaurants this is really how it happened. Um, again, I was on that slower path, finding the right fit for me, which. After a few years in town, I landed at Ringside Fish House, which was two blocks up the street from where we sit right now. Um, made some great relationships there over the years. Mm -hmm. um, one of my mentors from there was uh, Savannah Ray, a uh, great background in wine, um, does a lot of work with IPNC, very knowledgeable person. She kind of took me under her wing in the 2013-2014 time frame when I was kind of studying for my um, entry-level SOM exam. Um, already having a great interest in wine, the 2013 SOM film kind of uh, just pushed me along. And another, just the enough 
pushing the back, saying, mm -hmm. you know, this is a competitive wine tasting. It's like, yeah, yes, please, that's cool. <laughs> uh, so that's that was when uh, my thought to go through the quartermasters really came to fruition. Mm -hmm. And so Savannah at the Ringside Fish House would start blind tasting me on different things, and that's kind of when I um, applied for the intro course in April 2014. Um, between April 2014, April 2013 was the intro course, 14 was the certified exam. Um, and so after I got through that, um, that was a great learning experience. Uh, loved it, and then kind of was thinking I would become a SOM, and that would help build relationships, and that would be my avenue to, you know, start making wine. And then I kind of got cold feet right after passing that certified exam. I kind of realized I had committed myself to a career in restaurants, and I was like, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Wedding tables has been great in my 20s and 30s, uh, but I didn't want, I don't want to live my entire life in a restaurant. I want to be able to make wine and kind of be self-employed and do my own thing and not have to answer to anybody but my wife. Um, so the experience at the Fish House is great. I got my SOM certification. Um, another friend that I met there who was actually the, the SOM, the wine buyer just prior to Savannah, um, he went from the Fish House to the Steakhouse she filled his shoes at the fish house, and his name is Fred Armstrong, a buddy of mine still today, introduced me to my winemaking mentor, my buddy named Bradford Cowan, who's uh, become one of my better friends over the, the past many years. Um, so I reached out to Fred and said, hey, I, I know you're good friends with Bradford. He's starting his wine venture. How do I get in touch with him? How do I offer volunteer services to him? You know, how do I become buddies with him and ask him to teach me how to make wine. And at first, uh, Fred's answer was, I don't know if he's looking for help. Uh, he he kind of likes to do his own thing. And I was like, well, just introduce me. And he was like, okay, I'll, I'll introduce you over time. And that conversation kind of went by the wayside. And so I just emailed him direct. I got on his website and figured out his email and shot him a message and said, hey, you know, I'm friends with Fred. I see you're starting your own winery. I want to learn. Do you need help? How can I help? Uh, kind of left it at that. He replied, he said, yeah, I'll show you what, what I know. Um, he had done internships with some great wineries, um, both in California and in Walla Walla. And he worked a, a vintage in Argentina, I believe. And so he was just starting his uh, private label in 2014. That was right when I was going through my, my SOM studies and kind of learning about the, the industry on the winemaking side of things as well. Um, and so I wanted to be a volunteer for him mm -hmm. and work for free and learn for free. I had zero interest in going back to school, uh, still paying off ASU uh, loan debts 10 years later and didn't want to get back into that. You know, a lot of people in my shoes were lucky to go to Chemeketa and, um, and get some, some classroom experience and I didn't have that. So I, I needed to find a way to mm -hmm. get it for free. Uh, so I. I had heard that you know volunteering for Harvest was a thing, and I wanted to do that. Uh, maybe not on a grand scale. I, I knew that if I went to volunteer for Domain Serene, I wasn't going to get my foot into the cellar. Um, so I needed to find someone that was mm -hmm. you know small and, and starting up that that needed the help as badly as I needed the education. And I was lucky to to find that with my buddy Bradford. So he took me under his wing and. That first year in 2014, he was making his wines at Bodecker uh, over here in the Northwest, and he was able to sell me a half ton of his private fruit. So he had sourced some Syrah from a small McBee vineyard in Walla Walla that year, and sold me a half ton and kind of told me what I needed to be able to just, you know, make the wine in my garage. So I got a, a fermentation vessel, and he sold me an old barrel and a couple of kegs. And I would kind of just watch what he was doing uh, to his fermentation at Bodecker, and I would go home and, and do that same thing in my garage at my house. And so I did a half ton of Syrah at home and kind of proved to myself that it was uh, possible um, and that that was just the beginning. And then he solidified um, us custom crush contracts in 2015 at Brianne Day's place, uh, Day Camp, Day Wines. Uh, that was her. First vintage there, she had just scored that property um, and put together a small group of clients and I was lucky to be involved. So we were there, uh, it was 
us, my buddy Bradford, uh, Jim and Jenny, uh, Ross and B, Corey Schuster, uh, Bobby from Mel and Meyer, and, and Brienne, I think. And she had some assistants. Uh, the, uh, Kevin uh, was there. He was tons of fun. And it was just awesome to be kind of in a building with a bunch of winemakers uh, watching what, you know, what everyone's doing and learning from Bradford. And um, yeah, super mm -hmm. thankful to just make those relationships and land there. Um, a lot of it was Bradford's legwork, so I've always been grateful to him for that. And I've just remained kind of his unpaid assistant uh, ever since. Mm -hmm. How was that? How was that first wine? Uh, it was it was awesome. Um, it's amazing today. Um, I don't have much of it left. In your first year, you you don't really get to library anything. You got to sell it all to make the next dollar for the next grape, or the next cork, or the next label, hmm. or the next bottle. Um, and so yeah, everything that every dollar that's ever been made from selling wine has just gone into the next vintage or the next barrel or the next bottling. Um, so we still don't have any money in the bank, but we're able to just barely get by and keep making small amounts of wine. It's the dream. <laughs> so your first, first, first vintage, first wine you make is from Syrah. Um, tell me about um, at what point did it, did it become commercial? What point did you decide you needed to have a name and, and get licensed and start selling? And, and how did you go into that process? The it all started with that half. A uh, ton of fruit, and that's when we kind of started putting together a name, and um, just my wife and I sitting at home, thinking of different names. I mean, Edward Leffert Sellers was, you know, something that just sounded horrible. Um, and our middle names are William and Marie. I'm an Edward William, and she's Monique Marie. And William Marie kind of fit better together after you know many many different discussions, and then. Uh, just the WMW on paper was something that I liked. And then there was this old pig corkscrew that I had given her for our first anniversary uh, in Camus way back in the day. She loves to thrift and antique, and this thing was sitting on a shelf in an antique store, and she liked it, and so I picked it up, and I was broke at the time. So that was just a cheap little anniversary gift, and it later on became our logo. So okay. that was pretty cool. I reached out to an old elementary school friend of mine who was my tattoo artist and, and he drew it up for us and it looked great on paper so that just became the logo and actually originally I, I, I gotta take it back the, the first wine the 2015 Cabernet which was the first commercial attempt at making wine so the first barrel was in the garage mm -hmm. Bradford got us the contract at Day Wines um, I cashed out my super small savings that I had in the bank at the time and bought my first two tons of Cabernet um, as a kind of a piggyback contract from Bradford, um, from a small vineyard out in Echo, Oregon, on the south side of the Columbia. So Columbia Valley fruit from an Oregon vineyard that I believe was one of the first vineyards planted by Drew Bloodsoe, one of the first <laughs> uh, double-back wines that mm -hmm. he no longer owns, but um, nonetheless, that was great quality fruit. Mm -hmm. Got my two tons, filled five barrels at Brienne's place. If I was thinking about it as a business plan, I'd do it differently. I wouldn't have made a two-year Cabernet that had to sit in barrel. I uh, probably would have done a Rosé or a Pinot Gris or something I could you know, have a, mm -hmm. a quicker return on and, and invest more. So right out of the gate I was making Cabernet that needed two years in barrel and so I had no money for grapes the second year in 2016. So I did a really small like little GoFundMe thing uh, primarily just to friends and family and it was kind of like selling futures. It was like hey if you can throw me some cash now I'm going to make some wine and I'll pay you back when it's in bottle. And so we just barely got enough money. I shouldn't say we, we got enough money. We got a, a fraction of what we needed uh, from friends and family. And then an old college or high school acquaintance um, saw that I was doing this and saw the GoFundMe thing. And he was uh, just happy that I was kind of like following my passion, my dream. And he wanted to help out. He's, he was successful in real estate. and in the Bay Area and so he kind of surprisingly uh, reached out and said how much money do you need and I said well this this is like the minimum number that we were looking at and he said how much do you have and I gave him a number and he said well I'll give you the difference and I said wow um, so he kind of stepped up uh, unexpectedly <laughs> in year two and helped us get our three tons of fruit in 2016 mm. um, 
So uh, thankful to him from day one, and uh, even since then, he's um, thrown a little bit more help our way. He bought us some um, Napa Valley Cabernet in 2018. Um, that was kind of a joint project where he, he bought the fruit and I drove down to pick it up and made the wine. And we're gonna split the production, which I'm just gonna make good on uh, very shortly. So mm. that wine is in bottle and labeled up and I can't wait to get him his 25 pieces. <laughs> Love that. So obviously, you, you mentioned you, you, you came from a kind of a background of, of enjoying cab first. Cab was the first thing, and, and so and you're so you're all you t talked about so far are kind of warm warm weather varietals. So tell me about the choice of vineyard site, the choice of grapes to work with as you started to grow. Uh, honestly, it was kind of out of my hands at the time. Um, I was you know being mentored by my buddy Bradford. A lot of these first contracts were just piggybacking on on relationships that he had already had. Uh, he his. Walla Walla internship was with Long Shadows Winery, um, and he was kind of mentored by Gilles Nicole out there, who's a great winemaker and has a lot, tons of experience. And so he got a great uh, education or mentorship out there, and mm -hmm. he you know passed it on to me. And those first few vintages was just him kind of getting me an extra ton of fruit from from here or from there. Uh, but he does great homework and sources from great vineyards, and uh, he's I think he's got you know some help from from Gilles maybe for some of those vineyard sites. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's been sourcing great fruit and I'm thankful to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. I was able to source a few things on my own. Um, the first being some Pinot Gris um, from a Dundee Hills vineyard called Blacktail. Uh, that's owned by Siltstone, mm -hmm. um, right out there near the McMinnville mm -hmm. Airway. I'm sure you drive by it all the time. Um, so I met Joel Myers. Uh, while waiting tables up the street at Ringside. He was just a guest in the restaurant and I was telling him about my dream and I think, I think at the time I had my 2014 Syrah and barrel at my house. And so I was telling him that I was just getting started and uh, we shared some fun conversation and he said, well, I own a vineyard and if you ever want some fruit, just let me know. And I said, well, that'd be great. Um, you know, what do you have and what can I afford? And <laughs> <laughs> so Pinot Gris just kind of seemed to be a good next step. Um, Starting in 2015, we did the, the two tons of Cabernet and just grew every year, mm -hmm. adding on um, one new project, each vintage. So Cabernet Sauvignon in 2015, did the same two tons, the same five barrels in 2016 uh, while adding Syrah. And then in 2017 is when we added Pinot Gris. No, I'm sorry, 2017 we added Rosé. And then 2018 was when we got the, the Pinot Gris. So. Um, just, you know, one small project after another, slowly building mm -hmm. a portfolio. Um, I learned quickly in that first uh, time I was out trying to sell my first wine in 2017. I had my 2015 bottled up finally and I was eager to show it. It was probably too young, probably still going through bottle shock, but I was like, I have wine, I need to sell it, I need to get it out in the market. And so I started just cold call emailing local mom and pop shops. Um, and realized that selling it was a lot harder than making it. <laughs> never really, never thought about that aspect of the business. Just wanted to make wine and, and drink wine. Um, but the sales part is, has been quite a challenge. I'm gonna come back to that in just a second, but I'm curious about the, the making of it. You, you mentioned um, you, had a, you had a mentor in Bradford. You had uh, been in a facility like Day where you have all, surrounded by a lot of other winemakers, a lot of other ideas. Tell me about figuring out what kind of wine you wanted to make, what kind of, like, what was the philosophy behind your wine, what kind of style behind your wine, and, and where that kind of, how that kind of, um, uh, how that kind of came about. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned the Arizona days waiting tables where cab was just the, the thing that was going on. Um, and yeah, I missed out on the Burgundy wines and the Bordeaux and, and super cool European wines uh, until coming to Oregon um, and then realized things were quite different out here and obviously local was, was the way to go and so Pinot Noir was just the popular thing at the time when we came out here in 2010 and so quite honestly my palate really transformed mm -hmm. um, and changed uh, from just coming from Arizona to coming to Oregon. Um, there's a lot more, you know, sharing of wine here. Of course, we're closer to the wine growing region, so it, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. um, but my exposure to wines in Arizona was a lot more limited, and it was just kind of what what was selling in the restaurant at the time. 
um, in these resorts. And then, you know, coming to Oregon was a different culture uh, by far. And it was a lot more of a kind of a psalm culture. Mm -hmm. my, my first job was at Morton's and there was a couple servers there that were going for their psalm mm -hmm. certification. And so I got to kind of rub elbows with some of those people mm -hmm. and realized that some of the psalms at the time were making wine. Um, Marcus Goodfellow comes to mind, uh, Matt Bearson, uh, you know, a couple others mm -hmm. that, were, that were actually doing it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that was just another piece of the puzzle where, you know, I kind of saw that it was a feasible mm -hmm. opportunity if, mm -hmm. if I really, you know, went for it. Mm -hmm. um, what was the question? <laughs> what kind of wine style, developing your wine oh. style? Um, yeah, so my, my palate changed a lot in those first years in Oregon and although you know my my love was for Cabernet um, I still always wanted to make Cabernet I still always dreamt of making a Napa Cabernet you know someday in those early years um, and I that first 2014 half ton of Syrah was just what was available um, that was what I could get my hands on so that's where that came from and then I told Bradford I want to make some cab he was already sourcing some cab from a vineyard called Winebow, and at the time there was no extra fruit there, but he said, I'm gonna source vineyard from this Firethorn vineyard, um, and there's some extra cab there. This is what's gonna cost you, you know, X, Y, Z, and said, I said, yeah, I, I want on. Um, but I didn't wanna make uh, a massive Napa extracted Cabernet. I wanted to make something more enjoyable, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit leaner. He, his philosophy was making these European inspired wines and, and so that was kind of how I, I wanted to go about making Cabernet, was making a more elegant style of cab. Um, I made those first five barrels, one of which was new, so it was one new French oak barrel and, and four neutrals and that kind of became my sweet spot at the time. Um, you know, I have a hundred point wines are hundred percent new French oak and now I taste those wines and it's crazy. It's like they're so just over extracted and, and the fruit is so masked. Um, but it's what the people like. They like those point scores and those, those big heavy extracted wines. Um, and you know, with, with my palate changing, I'm glad I had that experience. Um, I'm glad I'm not making massive extracted Cabernet. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how the cab went. And then as I mentioned, just building on that, uh, as far as the portfolio went, I learned quickly that just having one wine to show wasn't getting me many appointments. Um, so, and it, it makes sense. I didn't realize at the time, but if a mom and pop shop has an opportunity or a window to taste wines, and they have someone that has one wine to show, or if they have a distributor that has ten wines to show, they're going to go with the, wine, the guy that has ten wines. So, uh, that was maybe just one piece of the puzzle at getting appointments, um, but showing the wine in the, the first days was fun and getting people's reaction mm -hmm. and um, oftentimes they would taste it and they would say, oh, I thought it was going to be heavier, I thought it was going to be bolder, or, you know, mm -hmm. not necessarily the experts, but just random people that I would mm -hmm. taste the wine and I thought Cabernet was bigger, you know, stuff like that. So um, I liked that that was kind of the, the reception that it was getting, mm -hmm. but also realized that if I'm going to sell wine, you know, it can, I want to make wines that I want to make, but there's something to making wines that people want to buy and so I guess finding a medium mm -hmm. um, would be the smart way to go and so uh, it's been fun sourcing fruit from different vineyards and seeing how they they turn out and how they they age in barrel and um, like I said that kind of 20 to 30 percent new oak is, is the way that I want to go um, maybe even less I don't I kind of told my wife the other day I'm probably not going to buy any new oak this year in 2021 um, both because we need to save some dollars and because I think I can get great complexity um, out of some, some twice filled barrels that you know we can get our hands on for a fraction of the price of, of new oak. So, mm -hmm. um, and I've been able to recycle some of my first barrels that I bought new and so that's you know super fun too. But um, no, as, as far as the style goes, um, being in Oregon has really changed my perspective um, and, and maybe you want to make more elegant wines, mm -hmm. for sure. And then sourcing my first Pinot and Chardonnay, um, you know, again, I, I want to make more European style Pinot Noir and Chardonnay rather than massive, oaky, you know, California style mm -hmm. modern stuff. So it was, it was a great thing for me to learn. Um, as if I would have moved to Napa and, and tried making wine 
in Napa, I'm sure everything would be much, much different. There's an interesting point of sort of adapting your palate based on where you are and based on what you're, what you're tasting. For sure, uh, you know, what's in the market. Um, and, and also, you know, going back to wanting to make Cabernet, um, especially in, in those first couple of years, there was something about me that just was maybe kind of shy or uh, about making Pinot Noir in well, the Willamette Valley, really not having a, a background in wine making and competing with the, you know, the, the originators and the Druins and the Domain Serenes and how am I going to, how am I going to make Pinot Noir that's going to be able to compete with those guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was, there was some weird voice in my head that said making Cabernet in, in the Valley would be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. and maybe uh, kind of a niche and it being my passion you know those two things kind of just went hand in hand mm -hmm. and then having the relationships in the restaurant was hopefully going to be my sales outlet and you know I mentioned the sales thing was has been kind of a challenge um, without the relationships and restaurants you know I probably wouldn't be where I am today or still making wine um, without having mm -hmm. worked in restaurants and being able to use those relationships to actually sell the wine as well so it's kind of a cool relationship to be still waiting tables and following this dream path and then they intertwine mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I get to sell my wine where I work so mm -hmm. uh, to, to some small degree it's almost like having a little tasting room and getting mm -hmm. paid at the same time mm -hmm. which is fun so you talked about talk about the, the challenge of sales and, and, and I'm curious how has that progressed for you how have you learned to market your wine better or to sell your wine better? How, what, 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 have, what have been the biggest sort of success parts for you there? Where, where, where are the best outlets and what are the best strategies you've found? I wouldn't say it's been successful at all. Um, it's, it's been tough, uh, for real. Without having the restaurant you know, backing and being able to sell the wine by the glass in the restaurant where I work, um, I wouldn't have had the sales. Mm -hmm. um, those first couple of years were just knocking on doors, trying to sell wine to anyone that would taste it. Uh, my mom's my biggest fan, my, my mother-in-law is my biggest fan. Uh, they, they, they sell the wines like Girl Scout cookies for me uh, to their prospective neighbors and friends back in Arizona and Colorado. So um, having the family support, you know, isn't uh, getting as far, but it's great. Mm -hmm. um, and then a buddy of mine who I met through the Psalm community working at IPNC, Greg Cantu with Rhone Street Wines. Mm -hmm. uh, he kind of started his own small distribution company and he's been uh, very helpful getting the wines out and showing them. Um, so he's kind of my sidekick local distributor that helps show the wine. Mm -hmm. I still get out and show it as often as I can and uh, you know things like sharing the wine on social media. Mm -hmm. um, May, may get a few sales here and there. Um, I get to pour the wine to people in the restaurants and, and hope that they go home and look us up and get on, online and buy some wines, and that's happened. Mm -hmm. uh, a few, you know, there are a couple times, not as often as I would like, but um, <laughs> those are the most fun emails to get uh, the next day saying, hey, we enjoyed your wine in the restaurant last night. Where can we get it? How do we get it? Um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we've just barely been able to get by selling the previous vintage uh, before the, f the, the following vintage, um, but it's always kind of a struggle wondering where that next dollar is going to come from to get the next packaging goods. Um, and then up until recently, uh, well I shouldn't say up until recently, uh, Carrie from Cellar 503 who operates a really cool Oregon wine club um, through Greg uh, got some wines a couple years back, uh, our first rosé was something she picked up for her Thanksgiving um, wine club offering and so she was very helpful in moving some of our rosé that first year mm -hmm. and then just recently I reached back out to her and she picked up uh, a bunch of our 2017 Cabernet mm -hmm. and threw it in her 2021 Cellar 503 wine club and so without her help we wouldn't have been able to pay for our 2020 fruit so huge shout out and thank you to Carrie. <laughs> But it's just these small relationships and you know being able to utilize and network through our restaurant and psalm uh, community it's mm -hmm. been great mm -hmm. i was fortunate uh, again through my relationship with savannah at the ringside she uh, helps run ipnc and so she invited me out to be a mini d at ipnc i think back in like 2015 or 2016. Mm -hmm. and so i got my first volunteer job out there uh, through her and then she invited me back the next year as a, as a full-on maitre d', and so I've been doing that ever since. And so 
Thai PNC Psalm community and going out to McMinnville every August is lots of fun. <laughs> that is a lot of work selling wine. That's impressive. Uh, yeah, it's I, like I said, I, I wouldn't call it successful, but <laughs> we've been able to get by. Um, and you know, I, I'm reach. I wish I had distribution. You know, those first couple of years when you only have 125 cases, um, no distributor can even answer your phone call. <laughs> and you know, we've we've slowly grown. So I think in 2019 was the most fruit we brought in, and I think I was in the 800 case range for 2019. All those wines are still in barrel. Um, so we've been kind of just trying to get over 500 cases for the first few years and I think that's when you can finally start a discussion with a mm -hmm. distributor but we just kind of haven't made that relationship yet so you know once we can actually get some distribution under our feet whether that's to friends back in Arizona or if I can make some relationships in California or up in Seattle mm -hmm. um, you know that's all kind of been put on pause with COVID and, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff too so I, I felt like we had uh, some uphill momentum uh, up until you know a year ago when everything shut down and so that was a, a bit of a setback but it's not like we were wine was flying off the door before that it was it was still a challenge but mm -hmm. um, you know that led to trying new things uh, I kind of followed in the footsteps of uh, Corey with Jackalope he set up shop in the back of a pickup in his neighborhood uh, and I was like well if he can do it we can do it so <laughs> I rolled the barrel out to the nearest corner away from my house and we kind of followed in his footsteps and tried selling wine on the side of the street. The, uh, the lemonade stand model. Exactly. I love it. I don't know if it was legal, but <laughs> we, we did it. We met some neighbors. It was fun. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm willing to try anything it takes to, to get wine onto people's table and people's hands and to their cellars. I guess it's better on their table than their cellar because we want people to drink the wines Mm -hmm. now and enjoy them hopefully and buy more. Mm -hmm. I joke if, if you know people ask all the time how, how's this wine going to age or when should I drink it? I say, well if you age it you're not going to buy any more anytime soon so go home and drink it now, <laughs> tonight. Tell me what you think. There's more available and you can sell her that. But, <laughs> um, so we'd like to get the wine in people's glass and get their mm -hmm. opinion and hope they want to buy more. I want to talk about the the wine making part of things for you. Uh, you, you. You talked about kind of your your learning curve. I'm curious, at what point do you feel confident in making the decisions you need to make to make the wines you want to make? At what point did that become? Did you feel like you were a winemaker? Uh, I don't. I still uh, kind of get shaky at the thought of calling myself a winemaker. Um, but after, I mean, I'm a very hands-on type of person. I, I learn a lot more from doing rather than reading. Um, you know, part of the reason why I never even gave thought to going to school for winemaking. Um, if I had to, you know, go through a chemistry course at 38 years old, I'm, I'm not sure how I'd do with that. Uh, so I, I needed to learn from a hands-on experience, and so I was fortunate to get that. And the first barrel in my garage was definitely uh, not my, my best stab at it. Um, the, the wine came out slightly flawed. Uh, partially because I was just going out and I was so happy to have a barrel of wine in my garage. I'd go out there with a thief almost on a daily basis and pour myself a little taste. Uh, and slowly there was more and more oxygen in that barrel and it got a little oxidized. But that was a great learning experience and never let that happen again. Um, but in all honesty, I mean, after that first vintage at Brianne's place after 2015, um, you know, being present every day and watching everyone's different approach and everyone's you know ferments it was cool that we were all you know just I think happy to be in that environment and checking out each other's fermentations and you know some people are doing native ferments and some people are inoculating and mm -hmm. uh, that's the path that I learned and so that's the path that I've stuck with um, got off track again lost out of the question uh, confidence in being a winemaker oh uh, yeah so I guess after that that first uh, vintage at day camp is when I realized that you know I, I could do it mm -hmm. um, and there was you know I certainly have questions on a daily basis you know I, by far a know-it-all uh, whatsoever and that's the other cool thing about the world of wine whether it's from you know being a, a psalm on the floor or being a winemaker or anything in between is you never know any, everything and there's always more to learn mm -hmm. um, there's always more to taste and you know, people ask what's, what's your favorite wine and it's like well I'll tell you when I taste them all, if, if that ever happens. Um, 
so it's just been a, a dream come true to be in, in the, the winemaking world. Um, I'm confident that you know if I was thrown out in the street and had the means to crush some grapes and put them in a barrel, um, I, I can do it with confidence. Um, but it definitely took a few years to, to gain that confidence, and um, but I, I'm still far from you know calling myself a, a seasoned winemaker. <laughs> and I, you know, without having the, the educational background, um, you know, I don't know if I ever could call myself a, a seasoned winemaker. Uh, I'll, I'll get those experiences in the coming years, but you know, I'd, I, if I had to walk into a lab and start running samples, I'd, I'd fall on my face. So having uh, the local labs in the area is great to send samples off to and get some numbers back and be able to read those numbers and make decisions based off that. So mm -hmm. that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of the extent of my winemaking education so far. But mm -hmm. um, you know, the cool thing about grapes is you can just throw them in a tub and they'll ferment on their own. If, if you want them to. Um, so it's just a matter of you know managing that ferment and capturing everything at the right time and, mm -hmm. and making sure that things are uh, managed properly and kept clean and you don't know, oxidize your wine and you can make pretty clean wine pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Never thought I'd say it would be easy but um, you know it, it wants to do its thing but if if you treat it right and treat it with love and treat it with care mm -hmm. it turns out pretty good. So you, you mentioned uh, before we started talking on camera here today that you're, you're just back into the restaurant game now after a after shutdown. So, so tell me about the effects of COVID uh, on your wine life and on your restaurant life and, and uh, sort of how things are, are progressing now as we're hopefully nearing the end of it. Yeah, huge. Um, my wife and I still you know, both work full time in restaurants uh, to this date, even though we, we've been able to make the wines on the side. Um, having that kind of profession has both you know allowed us to make wine on the side I, th I think if I had a full-time day job I probably couldn't do this on the side but being able to make wine by day and go to work at night has been great um, and then you know with with COVID when everything shut down it was uh, it's like turn the lights off mm -hmm. um, we were very fortunate I think both of us being in great restaurants that kind of shut down in the early stages um, we were blessed and thankful to kind of beat the major rush to the unemployment office and so we were able to get on unemployment without any major hitches and so from a financial standpoint you know that was able to keep us alive mm -hmm. um, but you know the wine sales just stopped um, most of our sales were to local small restaurants mm -hmm. um, and so that was you know kind of a oh shit moment um, the time at home was enjoyable, but it was it was tough, you know, selling wine and thinking about how much wine we're going to make, you know, the next vintage in 2020 and what can we afford and, uh, you know, the kind of the wine making just took a, a back seat to, you know, can we sustain ourselves and, and pay the bills. Um, so that was definitely a hit, you know, both on the wine making side of things and just on our, our daily income. Mm -hmm. um, but we, you know, looking back at it standing here a year later, we, we made it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, without having great restaurants uh, to work at, you know, I'm not sure that that would have been the case. So, mm -hmm. super thankful to have, to, you know, good restaurants to work at and, and good owners. And we were able to maintain some kind of income through unemployment. And then we both went back during the, the short reopening, you know, last October. So, we both went back to work for six weeks to two months um, after the original reopening. Um, so it was, you know, again, lucky and, and blessed to have work to go back to and, you know, that kind of kept us w in the unemployment system and so when we got shut down the second time, we were a little bit more confident that we could, you know, sustain um, mm -hmm. as long as everything maintained the way it was. Mm -hmm. But I mentioned, you know, following in Corey's footsteps and rolling a barrel out to the corner and selling wine on the side of the road. Um, meeting some neighbors. That's when I started using the next door neighborhood app to kind of throw our name out there and kind of saying, hey, we're your local neighborhood winery. Um, feel free to reach out, come knock on my door, text me, we'll do whatever it takes to get wine in your hand. Um, so we sold a little bit of wine that way. Um, we, you know, kept some shipping wine to our moms and <laughs> they were selling to their friends and, uh, you know, my, my small core group of 
friends that I've been buying wine over the years, you know, you know, continue to reach out and offer support. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a, a best friend in California that I went to high school with, a, a college buddy. Uh, him and his wife have been a huge support. They reach out every couple months and buy a couple cases. And so we've got a few followers like that. Um, I wish I could say I've been more on top of a wine club for myself, but I've been kind of lackadaisic about that. It's, we have like a little wine club tag on our, on our website, but I'm not uh, too good about it. <laughs> uh, so if I, if I got serious about maybe starting a wine club and retaining credit card numbers and you know, shipping out wines in the spring and the fall, which we will do very soon, um, you know, that's kind of the next step is, mm -hmm. is being able to, I look forward to the day when I can focus on winemaking full time and just be self-employed and, and not have to go to a restaurant five nights a week. Um, so that's, that was where the future always was hoping to go and mm -hmm. COVID was definitely a little bit of a setback. Mm -hmm. So we hope that, you know, things are on the up and up going forward. We hope that the reopening doesn't cause another shutdown and that we can, you know, kind of keep going on that uphill trend that we thought we were on. And uh, my goal was to always be done with the restaurant work at 40. So, you know, COVID put a little set back on that. So I've got another couple of years to go in restaurants before I think I can maintain this or sustain this by itself. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, hopefully we can build more of those restaurant relationships with the restaurants that are able to reopen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, someday hopefully soon get some distribution. Mm -hmm. What do you see for the, the Portland restaurant scene uh, in the upcoming year? What, what, what's it going to look like as things start to open back up? Definitely hard to say. Uh, definitely can't predict the future, um, but it's going to be tough. You know, a lot of the places, you know, aren't going to reopen. Several of the small accounts that we had have already closed permanently. Um, so, you know, from a sales standpoint, locally, it's, it's definitely tough. We don't have very much retail space on shelves. Um, so we're, we're going to have to work on that. Mm -hmm. um, again, we're fortunate to have great restaurants that we work at that I don't think will be affected long term by COVID. I mean, uh, currently at El Gaucho, we're going on number week number three open, and we're booked solid every night. You know, to the capacity that we can, you know, fill with the, the current mandates. But I think the the word on the street is maybe next week we'll go on to the the next phase mm -hmm. and be able to have more people mm -hmm. indoor dining. So we'll be able to seat 50 more people in the restaurant and hopefully sell more wine. Mm -hmm. that, you know. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that's the, the trajectory or the path that we're going on, but you know, it could easily fall back into another shutdown. Yeah. Fingers crossed it doesn't. <laughs> Absolutely. So you've talked about kind of the future goal for yourself, uh, self-employed, running, running the wine. Do you, have a, do you have an idea in mind for size of wine you'd like to be, or, or other future projects with it? Do you want to have a taste room? Do you want to have a vineyard? Or what, what, what's the future kind of hold for William and Marie, William Marie Ryan's? Uh, do I want to have a vineyard? Maybe not. Uh, every winemaker wants to have a vineyard, but you know, with every, all the variables that go into it, I don't know if I want to maintain that or if I can maintain that or if it's you know, smart to make an investment like that with global warming and wildfires and all. You know, Mother Nature is, is what runs our, our business, really. Um, you know, the, the, the farming and the agricultural side is an experience that I have, you know, very little education with. And so I just rely on these, you know, vineyards and farmers and vineyard workers to make great grapes that we can purchase and, and make great wine from. Um, we'll continue to do that. Uh, I think it puts us in a great opportunity to buy fruit from different places mm -hmm. where and when it thrives. And if we have a wildfire that makes the grapes unsuitable, we you know don't necessarily have to buy those grapes that year. Um, so that's an advantage to us. Uh, I would like to have a tasting room. Certainly. I think that would be a great way to, to sell wine, but it's also uh, a scary endeavor. And, you know, I've, I, I know people that have started a tasting room and unfortunately it didn't work out. You throw a bunch of money at something that's unsuccessful and you're back at step one. Um, my good buddy Bradford is in the uh, time frame building out his own winery right now, so he hopes to have his tasting room up and running hopefully by this spring. It's kind of another thing that's been put on hold by COVID. Um, so I'll be thankful to have some opportunity to share some wines in his tasting room. Mm -hmm. um, that'll be a fun kind of first for us. We did do a couple of vintages at another custom crush place called Urban Crush which is now occupied by Helio Terra. And so we had a small 
window where we were sharing the wines in their tasting room, but uh, it, it was minimal. So yes, tasting room, vineyard probably not, um, but being able to just have this, this custom crush opportunity mm -hmm. and buy fruit from different places has been and I think will be the way that we'll continue to go for now. Um, my buddy that you know helped us out from that second vintage in 2016 also scored us a Napa Valley Cabernet in 2018. So I drove down and picked up that Cabernet that he bought. And so that was another kind of milestone slash dream come true. Um, so it was fun to work with that fruit. And you know, just being able to say that we've bought in Napa Cab, Oregon Pinot Noir, Oregon Chardonnay, some of the best Washington Cabernet out there. Mm -hmm. Um, is really cool, I mm -hmm. think, in my opinion. So we'll kind of stick with that for now. Do you have a size in mind that you'd like to get to? Uh, the goal was to get to a thousand cases, and I thought that that would be a, a manageable way to just maintain in the first couple of years. Um, I think at max, I'd maybe want to get to 2,500 cases, maybe. I mean, I, I don't want to have a huge winery and employ a bunch of people, I want to be able to just kind of do my own thing. And so whatever I can manage with myself and my wife's help and my buddy Bradford and maybe, you know, find someone else that wants to be in the shoes that I was in that wants to volunteer to help me, you know, that would be great to sometime be able to have some, you know, a helper and maybe mentor someone else. I'm not sure if that'll ever come to fruition, but <laughs> it would be cool for me to be able to give back in that kind of manner um, and be able to grow like that. So. I don't want to get too big. I just want to be able to maintain winemaking pretty much by myself and for myself. And uh, I'd prefer to have someone that wants to help me sell the wine than, than <laughs> anything else. So um, if I could, you know, build a relationship with just, you know, one person that wants to help with sales and I can make a thousand to two thousand cases of wine, depending on the vintage, um, that would be great. I've yet to have the opportunity to get out and actually sell wine outside of this small Portland restaurant community. So, you know, a lot of the people that have done better at sales than me are able to get out and go out to New York or Philadelphia or Houston or mm -hmm. Seattle or California or where it may be and market their wines. I haven't really had that opportunity. Um, I think because we were making such small amounts of wine in the beginning, um, in combination with, I just haven't been able to build those relationships. Mm -hmm. So it's been very small scale, very local, um, but we're definitely ready to expand a little bit more. So you've, you've been around the Oregon wine industry for, for a bit now, and, and you, you talked earlier about how they kind of changed your palate and kind of changed your sort of outlook on wine. I'm curious what your initial impressions were of the Oregon wine industry when, when you first kind of became aware of it or came into it, and, and how it's changed in your mind to now. Uh, I wouldn't feel the, I'm the best person to answer that, um, just because there's so many people out there that have so much more experience than me, and I came into it rather recently, um, but like I mentioned, coming from Arizona, I didn't have a huge knowledge of the Oregon wine scene. Um, you know, I was predominantly buried in California Cabernet, um, and so coming up here was a big learning experience. Uh, that was great. Um, I think I mentioned the, the first major wine tour that I took was out to Big Table Farm, and I don't know if there could have been a better first experience. That was amazing. Since then, I mean, I've been to several other wineries and tasted and, and, and seen what's out there. Um, but before coming here, I think I knew of Irie, uh, Sokol Blosser, Erath. At the restaurant I was at before coming here, I think we sold A to Z by the Glass, um, Panther Creek. It wasn't a whole lot on my radar as far as uh, Oregon wines um, and basically zero Oregon Chardonnay at the time, mm -hmm. um, as far as I knew of. Um, so coming up here was a huge eye opener and getting to you know learn about these different wineries and wines and the Oregon wine scene from the, the early on pioneers in the late 60s to you know now having like 800 wineries um, and being part of that is you know still sometimes I, I have to pinch myself to believe it, but. Uh, it's been great, um, you know, from the, when we came here and where it is now, I mean, it's, it's totally different. Um, there's been a huge expansion, I think, with the existing wineries, both, you know, up in production, um, with, I think, Oregon Chardonnay on the rise. It's been really cool to watch. Uh, I think with Gamay Noir on the rise, it's really cool to watch. You know, these are varieties that uh, have very little 
um, you know, plantings. And mm -hmm. so from what I understand, a lot of vineyards are ripping out Pinot vines and putting in more Chardonnay and Gamay because of the demand. So, you know, it's cool to see kind of that transition. Um, I'm sure, you know, climate change is going to have a huge effect on what's going to happen here in the future, whether or not, you know, we're going to be able to um, get these grapes right before the rains come, you know, um, I think they might be trying to plant different varieties, both in Southern Oregon, maybe up here, I, maybe they'll try growing Syrah in the Willamette Valley, something like that. Um, you know, you see what they're doing in, in Europe, you talk, they're talking about putting Syrah in Burgundy and they're expanding the varieties that are considered part of Bordeaux. I mean, there's, there's going to be a shift at some time in the future. I don't know how it's going to affect the Willamette Valley or you know, how it's going to affect Washington. Washington is really cool because they can just grow anything they want, more or less, and, and it'll grow and it'll, it'll ripen. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's growing, for sure. It's, I'm you know, thankful and blessed to be in part of that growth, I guess. Um, you know, the, the Somme community that was here before me that started making wine, you know, was they led the path for me to follow and so it was cool to hear their stories and, and be able to think about how I can, you know, jump on board and, and follow that train. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's lots of the pieces that I wish I had more experience with and so, you know, just being in the vineyard, I wish I had more experience with, you know, tasting lots more wines I wish I had more experience with. I've never been a buyer, I've never written a wine list, I've always just been a server on a floor in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And purposely, I, I, you know, I enjoyed the lifestyle, I, I didn't want to get into management and double my uh, time in the restaurant for half the amount of money. And, you know, so it's been strategic, just waiting tables, it's been fun, it's uh, allowed me to you know, do what I want outside of work. Mm -hmm. um, but that'll come to an end sometime soon and I'll be able to focus more on this and maybe take a part-time job somewhere else where I can, you know, still do this and relax somewhere else and just make enough money to, to get by. I don't, I don't need too much. I'm happy just paying the bills and making wine and having food on the table. So if someone were to, were to come to you and ask for their, your kind of words of wisdom about getting into the industry, what would you tell them? Uh, go for it. Don't be shy. Um, you know, I, I, as a daydreamer, um, <laughs> just, you know, follow your dream. It, I think it, I'm glad I tried it. I'm glad I've gotten to where I'm at right now. I think if I didn't go for it, I'd regret it. Um, so I'm, I'm always of the person that says, you know, follow your dream. If, if you think you can do it, go for it. Uh, don't, don't not do it and regret it. Um, so, you know, I, I mentioned if, if I get the opportunity to mentor someone or, you know, pass on what I know, I, I'd love to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had, some, I've had the mentorship from Psalms locally, you know, from my buddy Bradford making wine. Mm -hmm. um, the Psalm community is, is just that. Everyone mentors everyone. Um, that's part of the, the fun of going out and volunteering as a SOM, whether it's at IPNC or at a local auction pouring wine. You know, people that go to these events bring special wines and they share them with you. And um, so, you know, it's, it's, if you want to get into anything heavily, you have to, you know, I think be available, you know, mm -hmm. offer yourself as a volunteer, get yourself in the door and then just go from there. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, Sometimes it's who you know and not what you know, and if you can just get your foot in the door somewhere, I think you can build an opportunity. Mm. Um, I've always kind of believed that I can do anything I, I went after, and so that's, I just put one foot in front of the other, gave it a go. Mm. So far, it's, luckily, it's worked out. I like that. That's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we, we didn't cover here today that we should have covered? Uh, I don't think, not that I can think of. It was fun. Yeah, uh, thanks for letting me tell my story. Um, you know, I just was a kid in a restaurant that fell in love with wine and went after it. And uh, here we are. I hope that we can just, you know, keep going, pushing ahead and things get better, both in the, the industry and the world opens up so we can share more wine. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll drink to that. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your time, uh, sharing your story with us, and thanks again. Yeah, to likewise. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks to you guys. Thanks to Stacy and Neil, Park Avenue Fine Wines. Thank you, Stacy and Neil. Thanks to all the wine shops that have gave me an appointment and bought some wine. Let's hope it just continues. Excellent. Well, it's off the hook. Thank you so much.